again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm Diane Mueller, and as we like to do on Fridays, we're going to talk um, to some of the thought leaders in the space. Um, we normally talk about transformation, DevOps, all kinds of DevOps, DevSecOps, other topics on Fridays. But today, um, we have a friend uh, and colleague who has got a book out the door um, recently at O'Reilly Flow Architectures major feat getting a book written and done and published. Um, James Urquhart is here from VMware and he's going to teach us, talk to us about flow architectures and the future of streaming and event-driven integration. And then we're going to have some live Q&A and a conversation with some other folks from the Global Transformation Office along with James. So type your questions in the chat and um, we'll let James introduce himself a little bit more deeply and take it away. Well, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure to see already a, a, a number of old friends on the call. This is great. Um, and uh, so my name is James Urquhart. Uh, I've got about a 30-year career in distributed systems development, operations, uh, you know, teams, team building, number of those other topics uh, in a variety of different roles, ranging from uh, engineering in, early in my career to uh, you know, a lot of things around um, uh, field for, for various vendors that have been in uh, the space, including uh, Forte Software, Cisco, um, uh, uh, Cassatt, Sosta, and, and uh, now VMware uh, and from Pivotal. And, uh, and then also uh, I've been, uh, uh, you know, a general manager at AWS, um, a, uh, and I've built teams at uh, companies like Sosta and in Stratus. Um, that have all been sort of uh, either in distributed systems application development space or in sort of the supporting infrastructure space, the early days of, of sort of da data center automation and cloud computing included. And then many of you might know me from a blog that I wrote um, uh, that was on CNET and then later GigaOM called The Wisdom of Clouds. Um, and so for a good six, seven years or so, I had a lot of fun um, uh, you know, writing about and, and, and putting my observations out about uh, the, the nascent at the time cloud computing industry and what it meant to the ways that were changing uh, the work that we do. Um, so as is my way, um, uh, in the, the last two years or three years, I started sort of saying, well, cloud computing is re reaching its maturity. What am I going to do here? And uh, you know, what are what are the what's the next big thing? And of course, there's a million next big things. There's there's not just one. But the one that struck me was event-driven architectures because that that flow of information and, and removing barriers to real-time uh, use of information in both customer experiences, uh, data analysis, and so on. Um, was really interesting to me. So that's where this book came from. I did some research and I had an observation and I'm gonna step you through that uh, in the course of the presentation and, uh, and give you an idea from this, a, a sort of very high level overview of what the book's about. And uh, I encourage you, if it, if it seems interesting to you, if you'd like to know more of the details or how I came to certain conclusions, um, you, uh, welcome you to, to pick up a copy and uh, and I hope that you find it uh, as useful as I meant it to be when I wrote it. So what is what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the future. Um, in reality, what we're going to talk about is something a little bit less than flying cars and all that kind of stuff. We are talk, going to talk about the ways um, that organizations are are looking to um, to combine their real time information with that of others to take action. And so kind of the tagline of the flow architecture book, and we'll define flow here in a second, but um, the tagline of flow architecture book is basically like HTTP link the world's information, um, the worldwide flow is going to link the world's activity. And it already sort of is, but, but uh, as you'll see from the flow definition, some things will come into fruition that will fundamentally change the math. Um, and make it much, much more, uh, much, much cheaper and therefore much easier to experiment and try new things and make things available to see if anybody's interested and so on, which will, which will just create an explosion of available streams and uses of streaming. Um, so what is flow? Every time I ask that question, this is what pops in my head. 
but I had to share it with you guys. Um, but in reality, the definition is pretty straightforward. What I'm talking about when I talk about flow is event-driven integration across organization boundaries. So not just within a single application, but across different organizations within a large corporation or even different corporate companies. And ideally in the long term, the real valuable thing will be when different companies can share real-time data streams with each other um, through standard interfaces and protocols. And that's really the thing that's not there today. The thing that's not there today is that there's something like HTTP that's super simple, that everybody's code is written to consume, that everybody um, you know, very quickly recognizes what a, you know, what a URI is for it, what a link is for it, um, and knows how to, how to take advantage of that, knows how to put stuff out there on, uh, into, a, into a stream and so on. And so, um, so what we're gonna do is uh, talk through a little bit more in detail about, um, about what this simple definition does in terms of, um, in terms of changing the game a little bit. I'll give you a little more detail because that, that definition is really good at a high level to give kind of core things, but there are some specific traits to flow that are what makes it sort of uniquely different from other forms of API integration. And that's probably the number one question I get is how is this different from APIs? And hopefully this will give you an idea about the specificity of that. So first, um, you know, the idea is that consumers are in are have control or in charge of making requests to um, to connect to streams, right? So, um, so they they can they can their self service interface can say, hey, I'd like to start receiving the events from um, from Stream X. So let's say receive these weather events from the from the National Weather Service, um, and uh, and maybe even put some more information in there about specifically what they want to receive. Producers then get to choose who they allow to see those streams and, and which requests to accept or reject. Um, now this, I, I do say, or their agents in here frequently, just real quick note about that. Um, in reality, it's probably not the actual data producer or the actual data consumer that will control that, um, that logical connection between the environments. There's very likely to be infrastructure involved in this. And there are a number of companies doing really interesting things in that space in terms of sort of decoupling um, you from the mechanics of um, establishing one of these connections that we're talking about. So keep that in mind. When I say producers, it could be that a producer is using a technology that does this for them or a service that does this for them. Um, consumers or their agents um, don't have to actively request data. And this is really, you know, this is what streaming is about, right? It's the push um, data. So when an event occurs, an event is sent and the consumer receives it and then can decide what they want to do, do with it at that point in time. Um, it may get pushed to a queue on their behalf so that they can retrieve it um, when they're ready to retrieve it. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things certainly come into play. But the, the logical idea is that consumers, uh, once they subscribe, they don't have to actively request data. The data um, is coming to them in a mechanism that is pushed to them. Um, and then finally, uh, producers maintain control, or not finally, but producers maintain control of what events are transmitted to whom and when. So they are, at, you know, basically um, as the as the, the party that is pushing data, they decide what data they want to push in a given stream and when they want to push that data in a given stream. And then the last, they are transmitted over the network using standard protocols. So this in, includes things like TCP/IP and um, uh, TLS and you know all that kind of stuff, but. Um, but it also includes to be determined protocols specifically designed for flow mechanics. And that includes not only the protocol for how we contain and package events um, and uh, the metadata related to events, which we'll talk about a little bit more significantly here, but also things like flow control and, um, and requesting uh, maybe a series of events um, from a certain time range. Um, those, those kinds of things will probably be also um, defined specifically for flow over time. So for many of you, you might go, okay, so now it, so it sounds like APIs a little bit, but it's not just the APIs, I get that, but now it sounds like PubSub. And my answer to that is, sure, that's probably the dominant model here. We are probably talking about most often concepts around 
publish and subscribe being applied into the way that streams are consumed across organizational boundaries. But in reality, if you look at that definition, you could do individual connections to a, um, you know, to a dedicated URI of some sort that says, hey, um, just start sending me um, events over this connection that doesn't really have the full semantics of publish and subscribe. There's not really topics. There's not really, uh, you know, a, a subscription ID or a, uh, uh, or a stream ID of some sort that is used to figure out who gets what, um, but that there's more of a direct decision to make connections. Um, but so, you know, just keep that in mind that, you know, I believe that, and I think everybody who's been looking at this believes absolutely publish and subscribe will be the dominant model, but it doesn't 100% have to be. And uh, so we can't really predict that it's definitely, you know, 100% going to be published and subscribe. So what do we enable with Flow? Um, so one thing is, is when we have standard interfaces and protocols, we're going to lower the cost of integration of real time data integration by at least an order of magnitude, and I would argue there's a good chance that we lower it by orders of magnitude. We're going to make your, the ability of, say, a, um, you know, let's say a, a, a service company um, to, to understand, uh, uh, you know, what has been uh, purchased from a retailer that they can service under a, you know, some kind of service subscription, like an, maybe you have a subscription with an appliance repair company that will understand that you know you now have a new washer and then once that washer is connected they can track the health of, of that washer through standard interface it's very cheap to to figure this out to experiment with ways of connecting things and i believe that 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 experimentation and we'll talk more about that in a second here but i believe that that lower cost of integration drives a few things that are really valuable um, you also get increased flexibility of solutions. So now, because of the decoupled nature of this sort of publish and subscribe model, um, or, or this, this flow connection model, um, it's much easier to compose solutions. If we have standard protocols where you can say, all right, I understand what's contained in the event, and I understand what I need to know to interpret the payload of the event, um, you can begin to link things together in unexpected ways, which is, the, the, the parallel I give to that is the Linux command line and piping. It's very similar, you know, because you know ASCII is being sent uh, as output from most of these things to be consumed as input in the next thing, you can use piping to link things together in really, really interesting ways. And, and in fact, there's, you know, the entire industry is, is the, the operation side of it is largely built on scripts that use piping fairly regularly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you can see this kind of manifesting in terms of uh, the interesting new ways of composing things. Like if I have a business process to what we've typically done in the, up till now is we have outsourced entire business processes. So, you know, my payroll process, I outsource the entire thing to ADP. But if I have a unique situation, it might be really nice to outsource specific steps of the process to an external party. And then for me to be able to manage and maintain the process itself in a little bit more detail, either on my own infrastructure or at a core vendor that then has a, an ecosystem around it that can fulfill different needs. Um, and so uh, that because it becomes a much more composable, it's much more easy for a startup to, to create something that can be consumed in those ecosystems um, because they know that if they, if they implement a certain interface and protocol that it's likely to work. Um, and the last thing is um, uh, that ecosystem story, right? So as we get more and more technologies that stream using flow interfaces, what we're gonna get is more and more um, uh, technologies that can consume using those the flows, using those interfaces. And as there are more and more customers consuming, then there would be more opportunity for vendors to say, hey, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's a, a bigger market here and so on. And that flywheel effect um, really uh, comes into play as we connect the world's uh, activity. The expectation will be if you want to understand what's happening in real time from vendor A, then use Flow to subscribe to their streams and, and, uh, and it will grow that vendor's ecosystem that much more and the overall ecosystem.
Now, why would anybody even want this? Well, the first thing is, um, you know, there, I looked at a bunch of um, surveys when I wrote the book, and there, there's the data's in the book if you're interested in the specifics, but, you know, really comes down to three areas. Um, the one I thought would be number one on the list was customer experience, right, is, is making sure that you're creating a situation where if a customer interacts with two things that they think ought to know about each other, think ought to share information with each other, that it's really easy to do that and anticipate that and be in front of it. And in fact, there's one poll that I found that said 45% um, of customers, B2B customers that were interviewed said that they, they might choose to move to a different vendor if their current vendor fails to anticipate their need. And so that ability to sort of say, hey, we can have this data in real time and be able to put the pieces together um, is really important. But what turned out to be the, the highest thing in the poll in terms of why people would want to, um, to basically, you know, do digital transformation and, and build a more real time experience um, is employee productivity. Um, which is not super surprising, I guess, when you think about it, but what they're really thinking about is, is you know, as data is moved and as they're interacting with, within their own organization, they're thinking about how real-time movement of data, real-time digitalization of their activities um, will reduce both lead time and processing time for their various process steps and, and basically remove constraints in their, in their uh, flows in their system. Which makes sense, but uh, but again, what I would argue is there's a there's a potential market out there that's phenomenal in which some of those activities which are just not core to the business that you have to keep uh, doing because you want to own these flows, you know, and and the only way to get that activity is for you to have an employee that does it or uh, a computer application that does it. If you could basically say, hey, I want to consume that um, that sort of very, very standard commodity activity as a service, um, you're very likely to say, okay, that's great. If, it, if I can do it in a timely fashion, I would love to do that and not have to carry uh, that, you know, that, that, and that labor on my books or carry that, uh, that application capital on my books. Um, and so, um, so doing it across organization boundaries is what I argue that flow will enable, that will change in a big way, change the game in terms of how people put together um, the way they process data and move data and move activity through uh, throughout their system and and the various ecosystems they decide to consume. And then the last one was was innovation. And if you lower the cost of integration significantly, you enable a, a significant chunk of experimentation. And so that's a you know that's a critical piece of this is is just imagine. You know, that you could just say, hey, I'm going to play around with pulling this weather data in from the government and pulling this, uh, this you know, available trucking uh, capacity information in from, from say, uh, you know, a, an Uber cargo service or something along those lines. Um, those things are, um, you know, you could say, hey, you know, I, is there something I can add a value here or I've got an idea for something of added value. And it, you know, it's like cloud computing has done in terms of getting infrastructure to try to do applications at scale. It's very cheap to, to just run an experiment. And uh, so I believe that's going to create kind of a Cambian explosion of the use of streaming and the use of flow uh, across the, uh, the business environment as well. And, and it's really valuable to businesses to be able to innovate new capability, new, new value into the market as the market adapts and changes around it. Okay, so all right, this is all cool. This is all the value, but but how does it work, right? How how is this all going to come together? Before I get into that too deeply, what I'd like to do is just kind of point out one thing, which is when you talk about flow and you talk about the movement of data, just flow inter flow without interaction with that data is just moving data. It's just moving data around the internet for no good reason. So as we evaluate what's what flow is about. And, and what the mechanisms are, or at least what the components are that would come together, um, we've got to consider not only what moves events across the internet, but we also have to consider what's on either end, what's on the producer side, what's on the consumer side, that, um, that enable you to, to take that information and make it valuable in a new way. And so what I did in the book, and I stepped through this piece by piece. So if you're, you know, if you're curious as to how I came to the conclusions I came to and, and what the, the different aspects are, 
is I, I started to do some things around uh, a technique called Worley mapping. And, and hopefully many of you are aware of what Worley mapping is today. I, I chose not to define it in any deep way. Really, as I go through this, you'll see sort of what the final map looks like uh, when I get to the end. But the first step is always to identify a need, which in this case is flow integration, the users for that need that, you know, this is a user need. So who are the users the need applies to producers and consumers in this case. And then I said, what are the components that are needed to meet that user need? And uh, after many, many iterations landed with this um, value chain that I think pretty succinctly um, identifies the core elements of, of what will make up the flow value chain in the long term. But how do I know it's right? Did I, you know, is, is it just a guess? No, actually what I did was I used a little bit of something called, if it comes up here. Oh, there we go. I used a little bit of something called promise theory, which is uh, another modeling technique um, this one from Mark Burgess, Wordly Mappings from Simon Wordly, um, that allows you to say, hey, you know, I've, what is the intended um, action, intended relationship between a promiser and a promisee? So if you look at the, the notation there, the arrow points from somebody making a promise to somebody receiving that promise and, 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 uh, and uh, utilizing that promise. And so, um, this is just a sample of some of the promise theory work that I did to kind of say, what are the relationships between all those things in the value chain? And use that to validate. In some cases, I had arrows in earlier iterations where I couldn't really come up with a promise that wasn't either a promise on behalf of another component, which is not allowed in promise theory, or which is itself um, uh, was was a duplicate promise or or just not a you know a very logical promise. So it really helped inform the simplicity of the map to really be very tough on myself in asking the question, what are the promises in the value chain? And it, and it made a huge difference in terms of the quality of the value chain that I ended up with. And then the other part of Worley mapping then is, is you know, he, he has, you can go look it up on the internet if you don't know a lot about it, but he talks a lot about the natural progression of a given technology for, as it becomes uh more defined and more certain how it also drives more consumption and more ubiquity and commonness in the environment and he identified four main stages that that any technology goes through in that journey from being a kind of unknown novel we don't really know what it is kind of a, a behavior that's interesting or or, or combination of stuff that's interesting to being a, an all-out commodity everybody knows exactly what they're getting um, and uh, has expectations about the exact behavior of, of what they're consuming. And that's Genesis, which is that new thing, custom built components, which come as we begin to understand the general shape of things, people build their own. Um, ultimately, a few ways of doing this work better than others. So people productize those and, and sell them um, or, or rent uh, for physical things. They, they might rent instead of uh, selling as a product. Uh, and then eventually, though, we say, okay, we, th there's a, a very specific way of doing this. this it's sort of very standard way of consuming these things. And um, it becomes very easy for somebody to either offer it um, as a utility of some sort or to sell, um, you know, basically mass produce this thing and, and, uh, and sell it as a commodity. So those four steps, then we can map our, um, our value chain into those four core components. And uh, again, after many iterations and, and, and much feedback from uh, some wonderful folks in the industry, uh, um, Derek Collison, of, uh, uh, one of the creators of Nats IO, was one of them, uh, Paul Butterworth at Vantic, who was also behind Amber Point and Forte Software, um, and uh, Simon Crosby, uh, who now um, is is leading the way with swim.ai, but previously is famous for uh, for uh, the, um, and its name's escaping me, but for the uh, the virtualization work that he's, he's done in the past. And so, um, so you know, really good feedback from, from really good people in the industry. Uh, and uh, we ended up with this. And it's, it's a reasonable way of looking at this is kind of the current, current state of that value chain in the market today. So the users, where the users are positioned doesn't matter as much. Flow integration is 
really just starting to become something that's productized. I think Kafka, I think uh, you know some of the the, um, the Apache stuff are beginning to be seen as ways that you can integrate across organization boundaries a little bit more. But there's still not standard interfaces in the sense that there's one way of doing things or a very small number of ways of doing things. They have their way of doing it for their their product sets or their their technology. Um, and I'm not going to go through every single one, but you can kind of get an idea. Like all this stuff around, um, you know, processing and queues and syncs, data syncs and, and visualization syncs and all that stuff, that's all cloud computing today, right? There's a million myriad of ways of interacting with flows already out there today. And it's just a question of, of taking that logical connection from being, you know, a little bit more of a productized thing and the interfaces from being a little bit more product specific things and beginning to commoditize those and standardize those over time. Um, so uh, the on, note on the protocol, the protocol is really divided into two pieces. There's metadata, um, which describes information about the event that you might need to know in, in terms of understanding how to process it. Not only you know, what's the format of the payload, et cetera, but also what time did the event occur? What, um, you know, what type of event category does it come from? Maybe it's uh, it's source topic, those kinds of things. So, um, so and then there's the actual payload, which this is the one area that will standardize probably less so in terms of everybody in the internet will know how to read any payload, but will more likely standardize in terms of um, uh, standardize in terms of um, individual industries or or even individual you know sort of customer ecosystems or whatever. Um, so, um, and it's already happened, right? If you look at the way we do batch processing, there are already payload standards for batch processing. There are already standards for payload processing of things like uh, electronic data interchange, EGI. So you know, I expect that many of the payloads that uh, formats that already exist for other uses will probably uh, transfer very well into the event processing world. But um, that will evolve, um, I think, as the metadata usage becomes better understood how industries use it will evolve as those industries begin to consume it. So, and as I mentioned, that today's technologies fall right into place. There's um, there's a lot of an analysis I do in one chapter of the book where I kind of step through uh, a number of these technologies that you see here and kind of talk through what they are, what they how they work to, with an eye not to sort of teach about the technology, but with an eye to identify how does it fit in the map? Does it fit in the map? Is the map uh, in, in some way able to represent how these technologies that appear to be predecessors to flow or, or parts of the flow architecture overall, um, that they actually would fit into the, the map and the way things these use? And so, um, from that perspective, I, um, you know, so it, it's there's a it's really interesting if you're interested in sort of how the the world today comes together. I give some really good solid examples of this, and then there's an entire appendix in the back of the book, which is actually about a quarter of the book, that goes through each of the components in the value chain and gives a pretty thorough survey of what the technologies are in that component space um, above and beyond what I discussed in the chapter as well. Um, but none of these are flow, right? They fit into the value chain, but none of them have those that, in, that one key thing, which is the interfaces and the protocols and sort of the, that, that common publish subscribe or whatever mechanism to deliver the data from producer to consumer. So it means we have to kind of evaluate how are we gonna get there? What are the, the different ways that we will begin to get to very standardized ways of doing all the components that I've talked about here? And uh, um, so one of the great things about Worley mapping is things move from left to right on the map in general, as we saw with that S-curve earlier, right? things move along that chain from genesis to being a commodity utility. So you can begin to ask questions about, well, how are things going to move? And so. Um, there's a there's a chapter that goes through sort of uh, gameplay, the idea that in Simon Worley mapping about um, the use of certain techniques and ways of, of influencing how a technology begins to evolve along the way on that map. Um, and so he's got an entire huge collection of ways of doing things. And, and I don't go through every single one. Um, some of this is left as an exercise to the reader, so to speak, but I do walk you through three very specific ones 
Um, and just as a, a highlight of it, you know, like the standards game basically says, you know, um, you know, you can uh, essentially create an ecosystem or, or 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 encourage an ecosystem in a marketplace if if your technology is is a good use of standards, a good opportunity for standards usage. If people agreed on a certain way of doing things, it would uh, it would open up uh, for customers a, a larger world of, of of technologies or or solutions to use for different purposes. Um, and standards might be a really good way to kind of move your technology for, forward. So standards game is kind of at the heart, right, of what I've said with Flow is, you know, the entire uh, uh, event-driven architecture ecosystem market um, really ought to be playing the standards game together. But there's also then, um, uh, you know, that, that flywheel that I was talking about, sort of more and more solutions come to play, therefore more streams come into play, which means more customers are consuming the streams and finding more needs and finding more uses which creates some more opportunity for more streams to come in. And that network effect thing is a really, um, you know, is a, is a big part of it as well. Like being very conscious and aware of trying to build network effects is gonna be a big part of the vendors that are successful in the flow space um, uh, in the long term. And then finally, um, co-creation is that, that idea of cooperating around uh, um, building you know, uh, the components for, for solving certain problems or building certain ecosystems. Um, so things like, um, you know, maybe the, uh, uh, the, uh, the like there's a, there's a government agency that works with the healthcare industry to define data standards and uh, around, uh, the, around healthcare and, and uh, patient data and so on. And so they could gather a number of companies around to sort of say, hey, let's bring our engineering talents together and figure out some certain solutions that we can uh, put together that we can then share as as you know, open source technology or just common technology approaches um, towards certain problems of handling patient data and moving patient data around, and also sort of, you know, working together to um, to you know, one group of vendors working together to compete against another group of vendors is is another really great way of doing things. So, just an idea there, but uh, and you can get a lot more detail on that stuff. But I think um, this is a really great way of beginning to evaluate a technology that's considered the future, and there's a a number of these other ones that apply really, really well. And, you know, you, I have a blog that I started writing around this. It's, it's um, so it's, uh, you can, you can Google it. I think probably at this point in time, you can certainly, if you follow me on Twitter, where I'm just at James Urquhart, first name, last name, um, you can, uh, I, I certainly will share all the blogs that come up there, but uh, I will certainly be talking about more of these gameplay opportunities there as well as time goes on. Okay, terrific. That's awesome. That's wonderful. That's great. What so what do I do with all of this? Like what can I do right now to prepare for flow or help drive flow forward in some ways? And so um in, in my opinion, talking and I've been talking to a lot of people about this, right? I've been talking to um uh I've been talking to lead architects in uh places like Microsoft and AWS and other places I've been talking to uh folks that have been involved in messaging and open source community for 20 or 30 years now. Um, and really, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at it. First, there's some basic patterns. These are just very high level patterns, but they have different sets of needs in terms of what you consider um, in terms of how you use the processing technologies. They often use the same processing technologies, just in slightly different ways. But so I, I'll go through these, you know, I go through the patterns a little bit. But I also, and more importantly, I go through a set of use cases that were shared with me by Derek Collison um, that are, he says, you know, as he's evaluated messaging and eventing applications over time, these are basically the four categories of use cases that he continuously finds and very, very rarely finds something that doesn't fit well into one of these categories. Um, addressing and discovery being, you know, discovering that there are elements out there um, to connect into the flow network and and I, creating identifiers for them, which is great. Um, and then you have um, command and control systems, where um, you know you, basically that's using events to then send uh, you know coordinate activity and send in instructions to take activity or events that that trigger activity around the network. Query and observability is about the ability to look at sort of uh, specific agents or specific small groups of agents, smaller groups of agents, um, in terms of what their what their specific behaviors are and specific states are. 
Um, so the ability to ask questions of the system of flow that you have and all the agents involved in that flow and the, uh, the uh, ability to observe and even sort of receive events of, based on the, the emergent behavior or overall behavior of the system of, of that small group of agents. And then telemetry and analytics are the same thing, but for the system as, whole, as a whole in terms of understanding then uh, without identifying specific agents, identifying a little bit more about how the system is behaving, what the overall emergent behaviors in the system are, and whether it's generating the value it's supposed to generate, and so on. So um, I go through those as well and talk a little bit about uh, sort of the technologies in, in involved and the approaches involved uh, in uh, basically addressing those use cases today, and and that that are well set up for the flow future. And then there's also this really, this is to me was my big aha moment in writing the book, at least in writing the, the latter part of the book, which is um, essentially looking at um, uh, how you make decisions about what technologies to use for different use cases and different aspects of what you're doing. And, and Clement Vasters, uh, who's a lead architect of um, the, the messaging and eventing systems that, for Microsoft Azure, kind of pointed me to a talk he did, which laid out this wonderfully simple sort of call tree or, or decision tree that you can look at, which is, you know, essentially looking at the types of events and the, the types of actions you want to take against those events and drilling down to very specific technology capabilities um, that you would be looking for to process those events, um, at least as a consumer um, and potentially as a producer as well. And so it ranges everything from, you know, if you're going to do a lot of interactive conversation between agents, you might want to use a message queue. Um, it won't, you know, they, they, they won't scale as well, but then those kinds of conversations don't scale as well uh, anyway. Um, but um, you might then look for a, a log-based approach if you're looking at, hey, I need to be able to, re you know, retrieve a series of events from a, a certain time range or a certain related um, uh, larger scale, you know, uh, like an ID, like a customer ID or something. Um, and, uh, or you might, if you do look at more discrete things, you may say, hey, I just want, every time I get an event, I want to take an action. Or I may say, you know what, every time I get an event, I need to trigger a workflow that may trigger a series of other actions and of either through events or through API calls um, in a number, you know, a number of steps to resolve whatever action it is that I want to take. And you might actually choose to use a workflow automation engine, things like um, step functions and Azure Logic Apps fit really well in there. So this is actually a really useful little section of the chapter and sort of understanding these different pieces and how to make these decisions. Um, and if you, if you kind of follow the, some of these guidelines and use some of these technologies in the right way, um, then you're fairly well set up so that as these interfaces become you know, standard, then it's just a change of interface to the way that you're processing things already. Um, and so it's a good way to be kind of prepared and, and uh, from a uh, interaction, from a flow interaction perspective. And with that, I'll say, um, you know, the last thing that I, I talk a little bit about, and I, I'd love to see more people do, the reason I wrote the book was to get the conversation around flow going, get the conversation around how we can make more of a, a broader ecosystem, more of a commodity ecosystem around event streams. Um, there's many ways you can get involved. There's open source projects to get involved with out there. Um, CNCF is doing the cloud event spec, which is looks like it's a, um, you know, very much has the inside track in terms of metadata protocol for the way events are being passed around. There's, a, I think all three cloud providers have been involved in it. Uh, there are a number of technologies involved. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, and then uh, also you might be a part of a trade organization or something. It's good probably to have a, at least a little conversation to go, you know, with the data protocols that we're using today, would they fit well into an event payload? Um, what would we have to do to, to change them to make sure that they do, if, if that's the case? And maybe, you know, read up on cloud events and understand maybe how you would wrap your data uh, with, with the metadata uh, in, in your specific use cases, your specific industry use cases. And then lastly, just, you know, a friendly friendly push to say, hey, the book's out there. It's available on Amazon. It's available on O'Reilly. It's available, um, you know, where books are sold, more or less. And um, I, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy. I uh, would be grateful um, uh, for, for, your, um, for your feedback, if you have any, once you've read it. Um, I, I, I write to learn in a lot of ways, and that's what I hope to do.
And with that, I think um, kind of open it up if there are any questions or comments people want to make. I'm, I'm uh, open to hearing. Awesome. So, well, thanks, go James. Back to the the Wardley map, the the first the the black before you got to the red. This one. Yeah, sure. So I think this is an interesting play. Like, first of all, meta meta analysis of Wardley maps is one of my hobbies. So um, <laughs> bear with me. Um, I, I'm I'm curious how um, some of these got put where they are, and we could talk about that. And then um, I also think it's worth noting, like when you think about what Wardley map implies, right? Is like there's a a, a, a current state, and then there's the things that happened before, and lots of what we're talking about was was sort of like the way the big web was built, right? Like Kafka was built inside of um, LinkedIn in the late 2000 some things, right? So it's it's open right. source in 2011. The very first um, the very first uh, Amazon web service was SQS, right? So that's basically yep. like yep. you know th this sort of proto or or like whatever you want to call um, yep. integration stream streaming uh, queuing type of type of thing, right? So like yep. lots of the big web was built with these sort of asynchronous flow you know one of the big topics at um velocity conference like 2010 was complex of event processing and that kind of stuff right so like this is is all interesting one thing i i'd be curious um how you're thinking about it in these conversations and maybe you could you could argue it's kind of buried in discovery um is governance um and and who has access to like i i think it gets this is something that's on uh, my mind because of some of the projects we're working on. But when you when you start talking about like data and, and streaming and having that be available, that's fantastic. But you don't necessarily want everyone to have all of the data. Um, so I wonder, or, or have you thought much about no, how to handle governance? Yeah, so to me, um, governance is a part of either the interface or a combination of the protocol and the processors. Um, Depending on what you're talking about, right? So there's a there's a lot of things about, um, and and I do talk a, a fair bit in the book about the challenges as we move forward, like the, some of the problems that need to be solved in order for us to really kind of get to a flow that works. And one of them really is things like data provenance, like how do you guarantee that the data that you received is the data that was intended to be sent by the the source or by the the next processor back in the process, right? Um, um, that that's a big thing. That's a big problem to be solved. There are technologies that are working in the right direction. No, not blockchain. Um, but um, but there's other things that that come into play in terms of uh, in terms of that. So you know some of, there are some technologies that begin to look at elements of that, and there are some definitely custom solutions in that governance space. I put it in logical connection in part because um, uh, because there there's uh, a lot of the identity stuff is being handled as kind of productized pieces of the interfaces that are out there today, right? So, identity, you know, the the flow, can, the access to a stream, um, you know, the you know, role-based access control or individual ID-based access control kind of stuff. The discovery piece is more about how you figure out what flows are out there and what the requirements are to consume that flow. And the reason it's very much in the genesis side for me is um, there are a couple of companies trying to already move into the product space on this, but there really isn't a lot of understanding when you talk to people who do um, event streaming um, about ways to um, to catalog the streams they have available in their organization, right? That's that's still very early. There's people still trying to figure out basics, and there's definitely not anything out there that has a standard way of describing you know what are what's the what's the uh, data rate that I can expect from this flow? What's the encryption method used on the payload? What's the you know what are the things I need to know in order to be able to subscribe to the stream? Well, what 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 kind of ID do I have to have in order to be able to be granted permission to access the stream? And so I put it very much on the Genesis side. It can be argued to be in custom built at this point in time, maybe approaching product, and I'm I'm open to that argument. But I, I think it's such an unknown and un, undiscovered space that I even argue that, you know, it's 50-50 that it could just end up being Google and web pages. Could, discovery could just be like APIs have been to date. There's not really a registry of APIs. You just go Google, hey, what's the API for Twilio? What's the API for, 
um, for uh, for OpenShift, right? And so, uh, or, or for uh, Tanzu. So, so from so that it's perspective, like the, the, the meta level is is all manual, and then this you, you maybe have a service catalog once you're kind of inside of the the family. Yeah, it, there are some catalogs out there like Bantic, um, a, a low code, no code event targeting event streaming has a, a really good, interesting catalog of the, the event streams within your instance of Bantic that you might want to consume. So, and there's a company called Solace that's doing some, uh, actually has launched a product that is intended to be an event stream catalog. Uh, standalone product that you can consume that's also a part of their their overall suite but you could use it as a standalone piece but i i think so you know so but i don't think they define anything about how discovery will work in flow i think they just are, are kind of first stabs at, at so so this might be nuanced my my initial impression when i first saw this is i kind of wanted to push a lot of it back towards the left mm -hmm. um, i'm not mm -hmm. sure some of it's as deep into commodity as it's represented here um I'm curious when you talk about infrastructure, like what you're putting in that bucket. And then um, in specific, I think there's an interesting nuance when you start talking about some of the things people want to be able to do with, you know, what what's it was IoT and now it's edge or whatever you want to call it, because um, infrastructure in that sense is in different phases, right? I think like when you look at cloud computing, mm -hmm. you're seeing the commodification of these sort of centralized pools of fungible resources. But when you start to look at the emergence of these edge um, solutions, mm -hmm. that that's definitely not not in commodity for infrastructure. In my yeah, opinion. that was that was a little bit that was a little bit of a a, a tough call. What I the call I mostly made is basically the hardware. Even in these cases you're talking about, basically the hardware is at this point in time a fairly commodity thing. There, there are advances in chips that are happening. It may. There may be another go round of another set of technologies like ARM that that, that that move into becoming the new commodity. But they're generally, there's not a lot of sort of highly customized ways. So so this, I think this is actually an interesting um, conversation because it, it, it touches on what's happening with cloud computing. Mm -hmm. So I think you can argue that the hardware is commodifying or commodified, but the operation of that hardware, the deployment of that hardware, mm -hmm. the management of the life cycle of that hardware, that's not yeah. a commodity. But I think that's out. I, I got it. You know, we could argue this again. This is what well, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand. This like, is what maps do. I would I would yeah, say yeah. that's outside of the scope of the map, right? There's infrastructure. Okay, the infrastructure is available. I don't care how it's operated to make it available to me. There's infrastructure I can run processors that, on that, the That's, on that's the why all these companies are bad at this because they think like what you just said. What's that? I said that's why all these companies are bad at this is because they think like you just said. I, I, I'm, I would argue that the, the defining advantage of the cloud natives is is this operational excellence. And okay. You better care. Someone better care. No, somebody not, better not, care. Not, I absolutely yeah, agree with yeah. that. I, I, if I were to break infrastructure down, that infrastructure bucket would spread out, depending on, on what you're talking about, um, significantly. I, I, I completely agree with that. I just think that... Um, for the technology need stack that we're talking about here, um, I think the scope stops at the fact that, you know, I just, I need the basic networking, compute, and storage that I have to have in order to support my processors, queues, syncs, and sources. That's kind of where, yeah, that's, fair. that's kind of where this I mean, stops. this also, for, for the listeners at home, like we, we have talked about this for years, right? Like this isn't the first conversation. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I've had with James, so. Yeah, I think like there's two there's two things that, that that I have questions about. One is like when we, we you can we could say the infrastructure is out of scope, but like doesn't things like data gravity issues eventually mean that, for instance, if you say infrastructure is out of scope because you're using AWS, they're managing my infrastructure, but they're also managing my storage, and therefore the map isn't actually as kind of freeform as as you might think because you're more likely to use queues, processors, consumers, et cetera, that are provided by AWS yeah. than you are to choose from random things. So you actually end up, you know, having more like regimes of maps where there's already kind of pre-configured, like the easy way of doing it that are distinctly related to whoever's operating your infrastructure. They're, they're, well, they're, I, commodi I, 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 they're commoditizing, can... but they're not necessarily interchangeable and fungible. That's right. right. Right, and and that and that's a complete. Although, all of them, as far as I'm aware, 
are based on open source technologies that are are at this point in time something that you could go pick up and, and create your own service that that mimics right so with yeah. the expression you know the exception of, of like kinesis is kind of a not it's not kafka but it's meant to behave like kafka right and that, but but the, you're right you could do a map of these for each of the major cloud providers that would probably lay some things out a little bit differently or at least you would instead of having just a you know, processor queue layer, you might actually have for pro, for queue, you might have four different services that could serve as different forms of queue for different purposes that are maybe at different stages. Yep. But um, I, I, one of the things is I do talk significantly about edge computing in the system because one of the things is how does flow scale? And when you look at um, that question, Jeffrey West's book about how systems in which something flows through the system in nature, in economics, and in, in, you know, in in, in uh, cities, um, how they naturally form, how they, they seem to form the same basic structures or very very metaphorically similar structures. And in that way, I, I fully expect that edge computing is actually a major component of it. Yep. And it's fair to argue that edge component infrastructure may not at this point in time be commodity. That's fair. That's a fair argument. Um, I, I, I totally open to that, but I would I would say that ultimately the the capability, the compute network and storage capability that you're trying to get out there through the edge, is is at least commodifying, if not at this point in time, commodity. So, so the second thing I wanted to like kind of poke at a little bit, like when I squint at this, the first thing it makes me think of is semantic web, right? Like you got discovery, you've got producers, you've got different ways of thinking about data, uh, you, and you know, so what went wrong with semantic web? Like what, how, how did semantic web fail to become this type of thing? And part of it is they started with OWL. They actually started with standards and right. that's what broke the semantic web yeah. because yeah. they couldn't agree on the standards, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering like, if standardization isn't something that actually keeps some of these things from ever becoming commodity. So I, I, that's certainly, before I even wrote the book, that was something I spent a lot of time thinking about because the, the, in the famous d debate between Sam Johnson and Ben Black always kind of comes back to me, right? And, and you know, ultimately Ben was right, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, but the, so what I would say is this, um, we're not talking about, um we 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 do have the strong we do have a distinct possibility that different types of streams that 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 map that i showed that that decision chart might end up with different interfaces and protocols potentially yep. right yep. but in the end an event is an event it's a it's a encapsulated state yep. change 100 yep right that has a time signature and a couple other things assigned to it so that's the same for all of them so so it's possible that the interfaces might be different. It's possible that there are aspects of what's in the metadata, for instance, that might be different for different use cases. A really good example is I talk about high frequency trading a lot and how the mechanisms work for that today. You could, with the way I have defined flow right now and the technologies I've called out here, you couldn't do high frequency trading with flow the way I've defined it right now. So maybe an interface protocol format that does direct port to port, you know, direct Ethernet port to port connections to yep. maximize speed or so, minimize so is speed. the argument that you couldn't do it because of the the latency or is there another yeah the argument would be that that compared to what they do to squeeze out every little millisecond out of the processing time um there's too much overhead in 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 publish and subscribe there's yeah, too yeah. much overhead really to, to kind of make it work extremely well um but like i mean part of what i mean is like you know even if you had all those apis etc the relationship between like metadata that the producer is publishing and the consumer, the consumer isn't required in any way to absolutely interpret the data inside the event the same way another consumer might. No, that's true. And as, as a result, you get these relationships that are always dynamic and complex between producers and consumers, especially if you start making them, you know, relationships that are cross, you know, organizational boundaries or industry boundaries. You know, again, because we've seen this before, you can't uh, you can't get enough rigor around the metadata to enforce the meaning of every field effectively the, at an industry level. I was really clear, you know, and then we'll reiterate the protocols 
or the sorry, the payloads are not going to be defined so that cool. every event has the same payload for that that cannot happen. And in yep. fact, what cloud events did extremely well is they acknowledged that the almost in the first paragraph of the standard, right? They're like, look, you know, we the the all we're trying to do is make sure that when an event is received by some entity that processes events, and by the way, the protocol isn't like um, it's not a byte protocol, right? It's not something that says this is the way you lay out the data. It says these are the types of information you should pass with the event in whatever um, yep. line protocol you're using. So yep. it maps. There's a binding to MQTT. There's a binding to AMQP. Yep. There's a binding yep. to HTTP. And so from that perspective, then all you're saying is this is the information that should be readily available and consumable about an event in a format that you know how you can pick it apart, right? Yep. And by doing that, it's not the, to me, the, the thing with the semantic web was they're trying to define the nature of information. Yep. Right. So we're linking the world's information. Let's define the, the nature of that, the meta nature of that information. That's a failure, right? We know that at this point in time. Nothing about the way I've defined flow tries to define the meta nature of what events are and, and, and what the world's activity is. I'm not trying to say, hey, these are the categories of activity. These are yep. that I agree that that won't work. All I can and I can't even predict what the future is other than say, boy, there's a real strong push. Like the specific mechanisms, the specific technologies that will win out, the whether it'll be public cloud that, that becomes the dominant player or whether it'll be some new vendor that comes out of nowhere. Um, I can't predict any of that. I can just say that these are the needs that get identified as you analyze the map and the movement on the map. Yep. And so from that perspective, all the only thing I can hold dear <laughs> and sort of say this is what I believe will be true is to say, you know, if we can define the standards around sort of how we re how we package an event and the interfaces that we use to say, hey, I'd like to subscribe to that topic. Yep. Right. That if we just do that much, that's an amazing amazing opportunity to, to create an entirely different math for integration. Cool. Yeah. Yep. So I'm gonna we're we're almost at the top of the hour, or actually we are at the top of the hour. And one of the things I'm gonna say right off the bat is that. This probably is the best use, at least this week, of Wordly Maps I've seen. So, mm -hmm. and it really helped drive the dis the, the discussion so nicely. And you know, I'm also a big fan of that, as well as the, the promise theory stuff that you've done. So, if we had another half an hour, I, I'd I'd talk about that. But I think, for me, this has been really an eye opener. Um, and it really kind of, we were supposed to on Monday have the cloud events folks on, but we had to postpone because of um, somebody had to, one of the folks had an issue. So. Um, yeah, so look forward to like next week or the week after, we'll be having a cloud events, um, the folks from uh, Francesco Giarni, who's at Red Hat, and Scott Nichols from VMware. Um, we'll be back on with Paul Mori and myself, and we're gonna deep dive into cloud events. So if anybody's listening and wants that, look on the calendar, and, and that's coming up soon. Um, I, I, I love this, um, these concepts and everything, they kind of pull together where we, sort of see the market going anyways. It, this is almost a market-driven technology. Um, and, you know, I think we, it's going to evolve. So we'll definitely have you back, James, and um, mm -hmm. bring you back in, as, as this all evolves. And the one thing I'm gonna say about this Wardley map is, and right off the bat is, I love that the discovery piece is in the, the heart-shaped part of the map, <laughs> right there. It's like, I think that's the key, um, as we've all sort of teased out here in the conversation around, um, building a rich and diverse and trusted um, ecosystem. So I, I think, and it's still, and, and in this map, it's still in the discovery phase, um, it's, or the genesis phase here. So I think a lot of work and conversations and this book hopefully will drive the conversations too around that aspect of it because, um, you know, J Jabe's use of the word regimes um, to describe how different vendors or different, um, Groups of vendors will will set themselves up. Um, I'm always leery of the word standards or standardization as well. Owl and like we could probably go on for days about other standardization efforts we've all been in. But really having the market driven piece and aspect of this and using places like the CNCF cloud events community um, and these to drive these conversations and um, figure out where it is we're going um, is really incredibly useful. So James, I am grateful for you have taken all the time and effort to write this book because we all know how phenomenally hard it is to get a book out the door. 
and for coming today and sharing the conversation and Andrew and Jabe and everybody else who's listening in. This is really the beginning of, of a really good journey, I think, that we're all going to have to take together. So thanks, James. And um, I look forward to uh, posting this up, getting people's feedback and um, making hopefully the slides available too. If James, if you send them along with me, I'll post them up. And um, I'll actually I'll put them up on SlideShare. But um, but Perfect. in addition to that, uh, I'll, I'll send you a link, and you can you can post them up if you want to as well. All right. Well, Andrew, or Jabe, any last words um, of advice for James? I mean, it's good to see you, James. Thanks for coming. Uh, I I think it's always fun to watch your um, thinking evolve. You know, we're all, we're all trying to build. Uh, this better future, and I think that event-driven architectures will be a big part of it. That you know, the flow architectures are are emerging right now. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's always really great to talk with you, um, Andrew and Jay. A pleasure to to actually get to spend some time with you. We don't we don't. Uh, I think we've met a couple of times, but I don't think we've really had a chance to kind of talk through things very much. But uh, yeah, I, this is going to be a this is the be very very beginning. It's kind of cloud circa maybe even you know 2007 2008 maybe. Um, but I, I you really you won't see this be a thing that mainstream is worried about for I would argue seven to ten years easily. Um, but it is something. It's an opportunity. I wrote the book. Um, I wrote the book to get people thinking and talking and and perhaps. Somebody creating something incredibly innovative and crazy that um, none of us expected. Uh, Lots of them are, are trying to use Kafka, so we'll see. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, and I think that that's why they need to look at that decision tree chart because there's there's other technologies out there that are good for other purposes. But anyway, yeah. absolutely. All right. All right. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks. Have a good one.